working drummer. Now kick it. This is the Working Drummer Podcast, serving up perspectives, experiences, and stories from ground-level working pros. Advice, tips, and secrets on how to build a career in the music business. Hey everyone, welcome to Working Drummer Podcast. I'm Zach Albetta, and my conversation today is with Jamal Watson of New Orleans, Louisiana. Jamal was born and raised there, and for most of his adult life has been at the top of the call list in this great music city. Over the years, he has performed with some of New Orleans' most iconic acts, including the Dirty Dozen Brass Band and Big Sam's Funky Nation, and also runs an elementary school percussion program in which almost 90 kids participate. Hey folks, can we talk snare drums real quick? Dreamy, loud, bright, poppy, clean, articulate snares, and well, do you believe it? Love at first sight? Okay, first sound. Well, before I get into all that, let me tell you, the folks at KHS America invited me back out to their place to experience a few new snare drums they launched at Winter Nam. And the drum I fell in love with, I was mentioning, it's one of the new Mapex Black Panther Design Lab series snares. It's called the Heartbreaker. A 14x6 eight-ply mahogany shell with reinforcement rings, I could instantly hear the possibilities with this drum, and our friends at KHS America allowed me to take this drum on a test drive. I've used it live and in the studio, and let me just say, it got noticed. Punchy yet warm, it never lost its beautiful tone, even as I tuned it lower and lower. The other snares in this line include the Cherry Bomb, an 8-ply cherry wood precise-sounding snare, available in 14x6 or 13x5.5, and and the Equinox, a 14x5 6-ply maple snare that's described as classic, bright, and articulate. Yes, all true. Some of the shared features of these four drums are the pure sound snares and the micro lock, cylinder drive with the butt end adjuster, and English mat. Okay, you know that little click click you feel on the throw that keeps the snares in place? That's what I'm talking about. In the very near future on this podcast, we are going to sit down and talk with Russ Miller and get the backstory on these snares, as well as some very interesting developments coming your way through the Black Panther Design Lab line of instruments. You're going to want to hear this. So just a heads up on what you're about to hear, uh, Jamal was good enough to spend his lunch hour at his school gig talking with me, and for the first part of his interview, he's actually sitting outside the school waiting for some food to be delivered. Uh, so in addition to a New Orleans drummer, you're actually going to hear a few minutes of New Orleans itself. I'm excited to bring you our first interview with a drummer born, raised, living, and working in New Orleans, Mr. Jamal Watson. Tell me, uh, Tell me where you're sitting right now. I'm actually sitting in front of the school where I teach it, and on the stoop. You teach elementary school, right? Yeah. What uh, What grade? Uh, fourth or eighth grade. And do you teach music, or is it like... what? Uh, strictly percussion, man. Really? Yes. You've got a percussion program for fourth through eighth grade? Yes. That's amazing. Yeah. Uh, man, I when I was in grade school, I remember we had a band program. We had like a little band, but but... No, no strictly percussion. Even in middle school, there was no percussion program. <laughs> yeah, the cool thing about this school is it's pretty uh, arts integrated. Yeah, what school is it? Encore Academy. Encore Academy in New Orleans. Yes. Cool. Um, and how long you been doing that? Uh, actually, this is our first year with the program. I've been at this school for going on two years. That's so. great. That's great. So, what is the what is the f- focus of uh, of the percussion program? Uh, the focus is to introduce all the kids to more than just the typical marching band styles that that's known in, in New Orleans. So basically, like yesterday, I had a friend of mine, Weedy Bramer. He came in and did like djembe, a djembe class and kind of talked about where the djembe come, come, came from and just the different uh, the different tribes that use it, who how you make it, all that stuff. Mm-hmm. And then... Like now I'm kind of shifting from from the Mardi Gras stuff because we kind of did the marching band stuff and we didn't march in the parades this year. That sucked, but it's the first year, so I didn't feel too bad. Yeah. But most of the kids were kind of down about it. But um, now I'm easing it into where they're going to use the gym bays and I'm going to set put a drum set in the classroom and show like how how all these parts can work together. Cool. Cool, and so I would imagine there's there's a pretty like New Orleans centric focus on on a lot of what you teach. Uh, yes and no. <laughs> uh-huh. Uh huh. Like I 
I haven't touched the second line of stuff because it took me until maybe December before I even told the kids that, yeah, do you realize that I actually do this for a living? <laughs> and then they started like YouTubing and Googling me and stuff. And it was like, wait, wait, you actually <laughs> you can kind of play. I was like, yeah. <laughs> so now, it's, you know, I kind of. I play with uh, Eddie Roberts a lot, so he does a lot of the soul jazz stuff. Uh-huh. So I kind of show them some video clips of that. Um, standard New Orleans jazz, but like when, um, right, when Clyde Stubblefield, when he passed, like I was like, hey, you guys have heard this, but didn't know who actually made the beat. Right. So, like, I kind of showed them that stuff, and I was like, yeah, we want to learn that. So, with that, um, I'm showing it to him on the drum set and showing how we can use it with your traditional marching band instruments. Uh huh. So like, like I do basically piano cause I have xylophones and you know, so they have to learn all that stuff. So it's kind of cool. Nice. Nice. And, um, is this a class that like any kid can sign up for? Or is it is, like, is it, how big is the class? So it's, it's set up where the kids actually have a choice to pick what we have more than one arts class at the school. So it's like, you can pick brass or what wins. You can do percussion. There's a tap class. There's art. There's French. There's like, it, the list goes on. Wow. So basically the kids have a choice at the beginning of the year that they can make. And, you know, my class has been the most popular one. So I teach from fourth grade grade a total of 87 kids throughout the day. Wow. Wow. So, yeah, there's a lot of kids, but it makes it hard for me to, like, pick, like, who's going to be my guys guys or females on my drum line. Right. But it works out because I basically make it a competition. It's like, hey, all right, you got to earn your key. Yeah. Hey, my food's here. Uh, <laughs> I don't want people to smell the food in my house. <laughs> <laughs> people are going to come, like, stick their head in your door, like, what you got? Yeah, luckily, the cool thing is that my uh, my classroom is in the separate building that they actually built last year. So Nice. Well, I, I imagine it'd have to be with all the goddamn drums. Well, nah, dude, last year when I first started, I actually took the job as an in-house substitute teacher, mainly because I was like, well, I don't want to really tour as much, so I just needed something to do. Yeah. And they had um, a, kind of like a little, like, they kind of let the kids like build their own band. So you had a drum sets and guitars, and that was going on like during regular class time. Wow. So... You'll walk in, especially if you went to the third floor, and here, you know, one kid, he was a huge Pantera fan. I don't know why, but he, <laughs> I, I, forget, I forget him for that. I was a, Pan- <laughs> I was a Pantera fan, man. I still, uh, I still am. You're, you're forgiven. <laughs> 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 nah, but, like, he'll sit up there and, like, try to play all that stuff on guitar. Then you had a younger kid. I think he was in seventh grade last year. He... He finally learned what a blast beat was. Oh boy! And yeah, so imagine hearing that at eight thirty in the morning. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> so yeah. what uh, what drew you to um, this kind of age group and this this format? Because we've talked to a lot of guys who you know teach private lessons or, or have a college gig or something like that. Um, but you're, I mean, you're teaching eighty seven young kids a day. Um, so is that something you had experience with? Is that something you were drawn to? Actually, man. All right. So I come from a long line of educators in my family. Mm-hmm. I tried to avoid it as much as possible. So when it came for the opportunity to teach, uh, I was just like, Hey, just let me know where you, I get let the principal. I was like, she was like, what's the youngest that you want to deal with? I was like, really? It doesn't matter because any kid, under like like from four through maybe sixth grade, they're pretty impressionable at yeah. that age. You know, seventh and eighth graders, they think they know it all. You know, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I was just like, yeah, just let me know. Like, I'll I'll start fourth grade if you want, mm-hmm. because in in New Orleans, as far as the marching band side goes, they can't really march in like parades until they're in fifth grade. Mm-hmm. So I was like, well, I'll start at fifth grade, and that'll kind of give give me a way to kind of have like a feeder system. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. So cool. It, it just works out. Yeah, yeah. My my younger grades like are my best performers, which really is kind of ridiculous. Are they yeah. really into it? Yeah, they're, like they love it, man. <laughs> and I'm sure once they started YouTube and you, they saw the stuff you were doing 
and they're like, yeah. man, screw this parade nonsense. I want to get up on stage. And yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I showed them a, a clip of I played uh, Fuji Rock, I think two years ago, and I was like, they're like, man. How come the camera's only on you? I said, just wait for it. And they, they just panned the camera and they saw the crowd. They was like, that looks like a million people. <laughs> yeah. So it was like, yeah. It was like, it, it's more than what we have in New Orleans right now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Who, uh, who'd you play Fuji Rock with that time? Uh, the last time I played with uh, Eddie Roberts. Mm -hmm. And the time before that, actually the year before that, I actually played the two years back to back, which is rare. Mm -hmm. Uh play with uh, dirty dozen brass man yeah cool i was i was gonna ask you about that are you are you still involved with dirty dozen or is that something you kind of came and went I, uh i feel in for him now with yeah. Me, yeah which yeah. is uh, i kind of like it that way mm -hmm. you know are they still traveling uh, a lot yeah they're still they're still road dogging it I'm, yeah uh, you know i think i you know those guys are up in age right right and they're still doing it and i'm like yeah i don't want to be 70 i think roger's 70 five now wow. 76 the baritone player yeah i think he's playing he's, he's like 75 76 and he's still i'm like i don't want to be that old and still roll dogging it yeah i, I don't want to do it by choice yeah man um i i would imagine most of our listeners have have at least heard of dirty dozen uh if if they're not hip to them but but just in case you know give people a little background on on the dirty dozen brass band and the place they hold in in new orleans music <laughs> All right, the Dirty Dozen Brass Band. Wow. Uh, they they started the trend of brass bands playing like R&B songs and mm -hmm. pop songs. Um, and basically, like, they, they were, they changed the game for brass bands because most people know, know, know of brass bands. Some of them be like, oh, it's a Dixieland band, which is not true at all. Like, right. That's a whole different thing that if you talk to a real cat they're like yeah we don't don't talk to me about dixon land because it was kind of <laughs> yeah yes tough times in life but, <laughs> but man dirty dozen um i was technically the third drummer after terrence higgins mm -hmm. so i kind of had to step into some huge shoes in reality yeah. because like he was their their first set drummer um and that pushed them away from doing like bass drum, snare drum, you yeah, know, that, yeah. that whole separation and added more of a funk vibe to it. Mm -hmm. You know, those guys, they play with, you know, widespread panic, uh, the black crows, you name it, they've done it. Yeah. And for, for our brass band from New Orleans, that was kind of, that was way past anything that anybody can just dream of. Right. You know, so like, but my stint with them, I can, I came in and, um, you know, I think like I Terrence Higgins called me and was like, "Hey man, can you fill in for me? I'm going to do this one more Haynes thing." You know, mm -hmm. there's a tour. I was like, "All right, cool." He gave me no music, <laughs> 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 and the first tour with the Dirty Dozen literally was from the first of November to December first. Okay, and we played basically six days a week. Yeah, mind you, all on the bus. Right, and. Like that was it, and I had I literally learned the gig on the fly. Wow! Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> welcome to look, welcome to New Orleans. Right? Yeah, right, <laughs> right, right. My, uh, I'm sure you're hip to the show Treme. Yeah. Uh, my favorite line in in Treme was when uh, uh, the the trombonist is like starting to lead his own band, and he gets a new drummer, and they're rehearsing, and he he turns to the drummer, he says, uh, "You think you think you got enough time to learn the arrangements?" And the drummer says, "Arrangements? What you playing? A symphony? How about?" <laughs> right, he says, yep. "He says, how about I hit two and four, and you shut the fuck up." <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, hey, that's it, man. Like most cases, people are like, "Oh yeah, man, I'm gonna sing you some songs," and you might get it the morning of, you know, because obviously you have nothing else to do with your day. You know? <laughs> you know? Hey, yeah, hey, learn this twelve tunes. Then when you show up to the gig, you might play one of them. Right. Right. Man. Then at the end of the gig, it's like, yeah, this was killing. But I'm like, what about the other 20 songs you asked me to learn, bro? Yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> and that, like, you talk about that learning on the fly situation. I mean, I I think that happens to a lot of drummers everywhere in in a lot of different uh, kinds of bands. But do you think that's that's something that's particularly common in New Orleans? Like, just feel it out on the gig and. Yeah, I, I think it's really common because most of the drummers that 
start. I guess m- more drummers here start in church. And in church, sometimes you'll end up, especially back in the cut, you'll end up with playing with guys. There's no choir rehearsal. It's like, hey, can you come fill in? And you have to learn those songs. So basically, you build your ear right. to understand like movements of songs. So yeah. and it just carries over because in New Orleans, like we base a lot of stuff off how we feel. Mm-hmm. It's like in most cases, if you actually listen to a, a real brass band, even like even using use the Dirty Dozen, like you can go and they'll play the same song. But it'll feel different. Like they, like the drummer might accent, you know, here, you know, Susan Phone player might be like, nah, man, I just want, I just want to drive it right now, you know. It, yeah, it's, yeah. It's all it, like we're we're really emotion based and um, depending on the energy um, of that individual yeah. gig and yeah, and like uh, I played with Walter Wolfman at Washington for a long time too, and he was like, man, he was like, man, being in the band, not only do you have a conversation. But you, it's like almost like you're a pastor of a church, uh-huh. and and with most Baptist churches or you know people who are spiritually based or whatever, it's emotion driven. Mm-hmm. So it's like, man, it's like, man, we feel like, let's do this, and they'll change the whole mode for everything. Yeah, know? yeah, cool. Um, you, you're, are you born and raised in New Orleans? Born and raised, man. Awesome. Um, <laughs> because <laughs> i like i uh i talked to um jameson ross that is my homie yeah i interviewed jameson ross uh a couple months ago and, and he, he's lived there for a while but he grew up in florida um yep. so i was i was hoping to also talk to someone who's like born and raised there um yeah. but uh so you you came up in a baptist church uh actually my grandfather was a spiritual church pastor which is it's that I don't even want to get into trying to explain it. <laughs> it's sort of like this. It's like a combination of a lot. That's uh-huh. all I'm saying. Dude. And all right. then from that uh that changed as I got older to where it was more of a non denomin non denominational church, which brought in a whole different style of music. Mm-hmm. And so, what yeah. what was different about it? Uh well, I guess it was organized. <laughs> 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 so yeah it was like yeah we're gonna have choir rehearsal and we need the entire band to be there <laughs> right yeah like that. yeah at a specific time <laughs> yeah like on time too like yeah so. right right um and uh talk about uh some of your some of the mentors you had coming up because i know in in a bio i've read you talk about russell batiste and gerald french and you know these these quintessentially New Orleans cats. That's that's the cats. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that that's the cats, man. Uh, oddly enough, uh, so I met Gerald French through my wife actually, mm-hmm. and he kind of like I was playing like hip hop gigs here and there, but I never really did like the R and B stuff. It was like either church or I was trying to play for some rapper, which mm-hmm. wasn't really popular at the time. And my wife was singing in a band with Gerald French. She was like, yeah, you should go sit in. And he, you know, Gerald's known for doing, like, traditional jazz stuff. Yeah. But, but he does some R&B stuff on the side. So mm-hmm. he, like, he let me sit in one night. And on the most famous sit-in song, The Chicken. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, Everybody talks for five minutes. Like, what do you want to play? I don't, I don't know. We could play this. No, I don't know that one. And eventually, everybody's like, well, let's just play The Chicken. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The chicken is the chicken move for all sit-ins. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but it's safe. But, man, he said it, and after again, he was like, man, it sound real good. You know, like, hey, I, you know, I'm going to start calling you to start filling in on some gigs for me. Mm-hmm. So from there, he put me, like, playing with different cover bands just to, you know, kind of get my feet wet. And from there, I would ended up playing a private party, and Russell Baptiste walks up. Mm-hmm. He was like, Talk, man. How come I don't know you? I was like, man, how come I don't know you? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I'm like, you know, and I kind of, I guess you could say I was a late bloomer to playing out. I was like 17 when I met Russ. And he was like, look, man, I'm playing at this place called the Maple Leaf with this band, Pop Girls Funk. Like, just come over. I'm like, all right, cool. So I show up. And Russ, like, he saw me walk in. Matter of fact, at the time, you can kind of get on stage from outside at the Maple Leaf. 
because <laughs> the drums are literally by the by door. Right, right. So I go by the door. He looks. He's like, man, come on. Like middle of a song. I had no idea what the song was. So I get in. Russ vanishes for like two hours, and I basically finish his first set. <laughs> you wow. Know that, but you know, he he walks in, and it was like solo. He was like, nah, man, man, forget the form, man, just play. Mm-hmm. And from listening to him, like Russ will play some odd time signature stuff that will have you tripping like, dude, how did you fit that in? And it still felt good. Mm-hmm. So from there, like that kind of helped got, get me going with like, oh, well, I can do this. Like, wait, a, I'm just playing with numbers. This is easy. I can do yeah. this. I like, I like numbers. I like money. And I like <laughs> music. So this all works. <laughs> It's interesting that those two guys are, are kind of your your mentors because they they represent kind of like two of the two of the main sides of of New Orleans music. With with Gerald, yeah. he's heavy into the trad thing, and Russell is more into the the you know funk soul R and B. Yeah, um, and you know I think one of the one of the things I wanted to ask you about New Orleans is is you know everybody thinks of it as a jazz town which it is it's the birthplace of jazz and all that yeah but what gets overlooked is all the other music that that has gone on and is going on um yeah. that that is also native to new orleans yeah it's dude it's so much cuz even growing up it was like church oh jazz then it's like you hear like pop girl swung then it's like like the meters and mm-hmm. you had the Neville brothers. It's like, man, all this came from here. Yeah. You know? So it was like, man, it, it's crazy that, because mind you, the thing that was to go back to Gerald and uh, Russell, the crazy thing about both of them, they both played for uh Charmaine Neville, huh. which to me was the, I'm like, I, I told Russ the first, when I found that out, I was like, dude, I can't see you playing for her. <laughs> like, like that's a pretty Pain situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, you know he's like, "Oh man, I did that gig for years." Then <laughs> Gerald, he did it for like even longer. You know, so it's just weird. And the, those and both of those guys have like played with like Harry Connick Jr. Played with you know, played with you know the funk, like Russ was doing the funky meters thing. Yeah, you know, Gerald has basically played for all different styles, and it just amazed me. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I'm still like in my mind, I'm like, man. I shouldn't be able to play all that, but he's like, man, you got to, Hey, you got to be able to make the gig. Yeah. Yeah. So whatever situation is like, Hey, cool. You got to play straight ahead tonight. You know, like, uh, I don't know. Like you've probably heard of the bell Crawford. Um, of who the bell Crawford. I have not. Hey, Google him. Piano okay. Player, all right. Right. So the bell kind of one of those. And it's the, it sounds weird saying that word. Anyway, <laughs> 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 but uh the Dev- <laughs> one of those guys like you'll be on stage and he'll go into a classical piece then be like oh man we're gonna swing out on this one and out the blue be like oh i feel like you know going to church on this one and to play like a traditional gospel song then i after that like he'll go into like a funk like a, a funk vibe and it's just all on the same show yeah and somehow he ties it together but it's kind of like, like if if you can't switch on a dime it it limits you on on the calls that you can get right right you know so but like those guys even like hurl and riley like like those guys like they can literally do it all like hurl playing for dr john now and most people remember him from doing the jazz at lincoln yeah 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 you know <laughs> so it's like wait up dr john hurl and riley <laughs> hey well, hey you come to all these better learn how to play everything real fast yep you know? Yep. <laughs> So. And one of the things that that me and Jameson talked about uh, it, about New Orleans is that with with all the different kinds of music that that go on in New Orleans and that come from New Orleans, it's it's almost all like some kind of party music. Yep. It's it's song and dance music. Yeah. You know, um, and there's there's definitely some some great artistic, you know, more more expressive music that has come out of New Orleans, but like the main the main thing is a party. Yeah, you're you're gonna be able to dance off it. Yeah. Bottom line. Yeah. So have, have fun, dance. <laughs> have have there been some some drummers or some other players that have like come to New Orleans from somewhere else and, and not been pocket enough or been too straight ahead with shit or uh that's a hard one. Um because most guys when they first come like 
like when Jameson first came to town, like I knew Jameson, like we had met briefly, like a few years before that. And I think he did like a Fantasia gig or something. Hmm. But his, I think his dad was like a gospel writer, if I'm not mistaken. He mm-hmm. did something really heavy in the gospel, gospel scene. So when he came to New Orleans, it was like he had a pocket. Yeah. And like he had a feel, but it wasn't the New Orleans feel yet. And like, and he like dove into it like head first. Yeah. Yeah. And, it's where we ended up playing the same gig. Like I was playing with, when, I think when Jameson moved here, I was doing, doing a run with a uh, Glenn David Andrews uh-huh. and Jameson ended up doing that gig for a second. Mm-hmm. And there's another cat from Florida, uh, AJ Hall. Like he's playing with John Cleary now. Mm-hmm. Like, and you see those guys, they've studied this stuff, but you can study, like I'll tell anybody, like you can read a book, you can watch as many videos as you want about New Orleans you won't get it until you come here. Yeah. And you have to like work with the cats. Right. You know, so like they did it and it was like, and you can hear it. It's crazy. Like listening to like Jameson, AJ and like all the guys that moved here from different States, like hearing them play now from how, when they first got here, it's just like, yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> and you talk about the New Orleans feel. Like, is it is it possible to put that into words? Is it possible to describe what about New Orleans music has a different feel to it? I can't. I never could put it in words. Like, uh-huh. I can't put it in words. You can't. Like, it's really like it's a it's an experience, man. Like, mm-hmm. it's like from every player that's from here, you. Like, you've grown up hearing, like, the Indians doing Mardi Gras, they brass man here. Like, you know, you decide that, hey, man, let's go take a walk in the quarter. You hear this trad band playing this. Mm-hmm. And everybody has their touch to it. But it's like going up hearing that, then when it's your time to play, it's like you have all that influence come, like, inside of you already. You know, like, I, like my son, he's, he's my son that's sad. My son's 12, <laughs> right? And I did a I did a gig at Preservation Hall, and like he's one of those kids that can kind of play almost anything. Mm-hmm. Like makes me sick. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it was like we're in there, and he decided to get on the drums. Mind you, I never really showed him the whole the whole Preservation Hall style because that's a style. Mm-hmm. And he walked and he told the guitar player, he's like, hey. I just want, like, can you play something with me? And he just went into like the second line groove. Wow. And that's based off of what he heard. Like, even my youngest son, he'll get on and he'll play, and it's off of what he's experienced. Mm-hmm. So, most of the, like, most of the music, even when you're playing, it's your experience. Yeah. You know, like, you can, you know, a, a, a few guys have made books talking about, yeah, because, you know, you know, this guy played it like this, and you got this cat, you know, from 1945, he did this. And that was for them because that was their experience. Mm -hmm. Like me, I grew up, I'm in a weird, I'm in that weird time gap to where it's like, I have the old school stuff, but then there's all this new stuff. So it's like, when I, when I play like a second line groove, I like, it's more new age and you'll see some of the old cats kind of looking like, what you doing over there? (laughs) 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 And And like, they don't complain. And they don't be like, oh, nah, that's wrong. No, it's more like, wow, like, that's dope. Like, like hearing Jameson and, like, AJ and, you know, the, the guy who's playing for Dirty Dozen now, uh, Julian Addison. Like, uh-huh. all of them, bad cats. And you hear them play it, and they're basing that off of their experience. Yeah. Like, you know, like, it's what they've heard. And just from where they're from, it's like, you you know, Miami, Miami, Florida, like, Florida has a huge, like, I guess Cuban population and Mm -hmm. all that. So they'll play it and you can kind of hear that sneaking in. Yeah. You know, but Hey, it's your feel. Right. And it sounds like the, you're, you're saying that the, the musical community in new Orleans is, is open to that. And they're, they're willing to let, you know, a a personal flavor kind of enter an old feel like a second line or whatever it is you're talking about. Because I've talked to, you know, my, my background is in jazz and I've, I've talked to, um, some drummers who are heavy into blues and in, in both those, um, genres, there's like, there's the jazz Nazis and there's the blues Nazis who like, if, if something, yeah. something new comes along, if there's a new flavor in it, they're like, yeah. man, that ain't it. That like, yeah. you're screwing it up. Um, but it, you know, 
that that kind of confirms something that I already kind of believed about New Orleans is that yeah. it's it's like come one come all bring yeah. your, bring your thing and and let's party on it. Yeah, that, and that's true, man. Like I've seen guys come to town and it's like and just take it take it all in, but it's like, well, I like doing this style of music. I like doing this. I like doing that, and it works for them. Mm-hmm. You yeah, know, like uh, there's the band The Revivalist. Most of the guys were at Loyola, or I think, yeah, Loyola, right? They're t- they're doing more of a rock style, and they're selling out like places like crazy. Yeah, and they're from here. Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, like that band was built here, mm-hmm. and it's like just watching them. Like I remember them playing like at Blue Nile or something, and it was like maybe thirty people. So now it's like, yeah, you can't you can't get a ticket. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So where do you go to find a treasure trove of information about vintage drums, custom drums, and legendary drummers? NotSoModernDrummer.com Since 1988, Not so Modern Drummer is an institution dedicated to researching and documenting the history of modern drums, the art of drum building, and the legendary drummers who play them. The writers and contributors are some of the top vintage and custom drum experts from around the world. Not So Modern Drummer serves as an online gathering place and marketplace for the worldwide community of drummers who buy and sell, collect, preserve, and play these instruments. It also hosts drum-related events that are attended by drummers from all over the world. This website is easy and fun to explore, and the monthly digital magazine subscription is free. So check out NotSoModernDrummer.com. You mentioned uh, Eddie Roberts earlier. Is he is he one of your one of your main gigs that you're that you're working a lot with these days? Um, technically, I have no main gigs anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's kind of like Eddie calls is like, all right, cool. I have these shows lined up. Let's do this. And we have the side project because he has his main, the main band, uh, New Master Sounds. Right, right. The other project was called the West Coast Sounds. Hmm. You know, and we we actually recorded a record a few years ago. Um, so we have that, and just you know whatever calls really. It's kind of like, hey, there's a party they want us to play. You want to come to Denver? Sure, why not? Who <laughs> yeah. would turn down a trip to Denver? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and tell people about Eddie's style. Is he a New Orleans native? No, Eddie is from um, England, man. Actually, he's Welsh. Really. Um, Yes. Wow. And he he lived in New Orleans for I don't think he lived in New Orleans for a year fully. Because he <laughs> moved there. He moved there and was on the road for like six months. Right. He moved back and ended up uh got engaged and married and moved to Denver. Okay. So yeah. Gotcha. Um and so he's he's a guitarist, he sings too? No, I've never heard Eddie say. <laughs> really? Okay. Nah, yeah, it's all it's all instrumental, man. That's the other thing about New Orleans, man. There's like a huge contingent of just instrumental music. Yeah. Um and like even I mean you play like trio setting with with Eddie, right? Yeah. Um and you know Dirty Dozen is obviously a big brass band and you look at uh, other instrumental groups like, you know, Stanton Moore's thing yeah. over there. Um, but just in a trio setting, like he's writing original yeah. tunes and play the music, man. Yeah. Uh, the, I think the one thing I, I tell people, like, cause I have like a trio that I do, then I have like a bigger band that I have. Uh, and the one thing I tell people, I'm like, the one thing that can destroy a song is lyrics. <laughs> so, <laughs> Hey, let people come up with their own. Lyrics. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, yeah. Like, and, and, I, I just hold fast to that. Like, you know, and my, my wife's a singer. Like, she just, like, put out her record. Mm-hmm. And her lyrics are dope. She, she's, she's like, she the lyrics make sense. Yeah. But the music, even without the lyrics, is still good. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So right. I was uh, digging on, uh, digging in your in your YouTube history and so forth and, and came, across, uh, <laughs> came across that project you did recently called Atticid. Oh yeah, yeah. That is cool as hell, man. So that's one know what's funny about that. Yeah. That that those guys are in San Francisco. They're in the Bay Area. Right, right. And so I I met them playing with Eddie at the Boom Boom Room in San Francisco. Wow. And that project, they was like, yeah, man. 
like we really want to have like this New Orleans vibe going. And I was like, yeah, uh, you know, whatever, cool. Let me know. And matter of fact, at the same time I was recording the record with Eddie, they had a spot in the same studio. And was like, yo, can you just come lay down some stuff? And I was like, all right, like what's the idea? And I was like, well, whatever you play, we're gonna base everything off it. Hmm. Like we want, we want to write to what you play. And I was like, all right, dope. So we did it. Like I just did like some little snippets of some. Just some ideas. Yeah. And it was like, yeah, man, well, we're going to do this. So like, a few months later, I ended up back in San Francisco, back in the Bay Area, and they were just like, all right, cool. We have a date. I think we did two days in the studio for that record. Mm-hmm. Now, the horns, I don't know, because those horn lines are, are like, retarded. They're <laughs> pretty special. I can't think yeah. of that. But, yeah, like, like those, that's a cool, like, group of guys. And they're still, like, doing shows in, like, San Francisco, like, but, right, you know. and that's that's another instrumental project. Um, yep. <laughs> and when I when I listened to it, it was like it 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 suddenly made sense. Like you wouldn't you wouldn't think of it, but the like the New Orleans kind of brass band vibe um, has a lot in common with the the Bay Area Oakland Tower Power mm-hmm. yep. horn band vibe. Um, and it just immediately made sense. I was like, of course, of course. You yeah. hook up the New Orleans grooves with like that that Bay Area kind of horn section yeah. thing. Um, that yeah. So you made you made one record with them. One record. That yeah. was 2015. And, yes. That's a cool cool project, man. Yeah. Um, the other the other uh, artist that that popped up in your history who I love is uh, is Big Sam. Yep. I did. Yep. <laughs> tell people. Tell people about Big Sam and Big Sam's Funky Nation. Man, Big Sam's Funky Nation is that's a party band. Bottom line. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like no questions asked. Like it's a party. Bottom. You know. Um. That. That's weird. So that gig started. How I ended up playing that gig. Alvin Ford was playing with that man before I ended up playing with him. Mm-hmm. Um. And Alvin's playing with like Pretty Lights right now. He's like. You know, he's a superstar, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but nah, um, so Tip Team just had like an anniversary show. I was playing Walter Wolfman Washington and Big Sam was the special guest with us. Mm-hmm. And he did like some James Brown to him. Like, he was, so after we played, he was like, yeah, man, give me a number, man. Like, I might need you to like fill in on some stuff. I'm like, all right, cool. So get the call. He's like, all right. We're playing a flower show in Philadelphia, <laughs> which which was crazy because it was a big deal. I had no idea that home and garden stuff was that huge. Oh, yeah. So we're playing like the stage and, you know, he sent me the music. I was like, man, this is dope. Like, like you know, like it, it can get really loud. Mm-hmm. But, <laughs> like, but, but yeah, I like it. So we're playing. And you would think it's a flower show in a convention center that, hey, no, nah, we're not going to do that. We're going to kind of keep it simple. Not nah, out the gate. Right. It was like, I think the we did like, he had this, has the song of feeling like a party. So it was like, hey, cranked. Like, I was like, damn, I like this. <laughs> you know? And so from there, it was like, we did that. And so I'm like, oh, cool. I feel then like going home. And two weeks later, he's like, look, I need somebody full time. Wow. I'm like, wow, like dope. Let's do it. Yeah. So I think I did Big Sam's band for like three years, maybe. Which it's crazy that how all that happened. <laughs> all right. So like think about the timeline, like people I played with and how I ended up in other bands. <laughs> like, yeah. So, yeah. So like Walter to Big Sam to Big Sam to like like Glenn Andrews to Glenn Andrews to like the Dirty Dozen. And thirty thousand to everybody else, right? Like it's, and some of the guys like, once I stopped playing with one band, my homie started playing with, which band it was? All right, I think it was like, yeah, Dirty Dozen. I stopped playing with Dirty Dozen. Alvin Ford started doing a gig, and I started doing like a gig he was doing. Mm-hmm. And it was like we flip flop gigs, and like that happened for like a long time with a whole bunch of bands. But like, yo, this is, it's cool. Yeah, but it's like wow, like. It's like we just switching, just switch gigs. Yeah, like <laughs> yeah, it's just a merry-go-round, man. Everybody yeah. <laughs> just switch horses right now. Yeah. Um, I remember so I saw Big Sam for the first time. Uh, this was probably six years ago. Uh, I was living in L.A. at the time. I was playing in a little kind of kind of funky fusion trio, 
and and we opened for Big Sam uh, in in San Diego at a club in San Diego. Okay. And at the time, I was I was much more of a jazz head, um, and I like we we did our set, and and I saw Big Sam, and I did not like him. I was like, man, these guys. <laughs> It's 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 just repetitive and it's loud and like the the lines aren't very complicated like you know so I left I left that night like Big Sam whatever New Orleans you know that I don't I don't know and you know my, I hadn't been to New Orleans yet so my my misconception about New Orleans is like wow these guys are from New Orleans I'm surprised they go over in New Orleans because they're just big big and loud and 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 all that. But then, you know, since then, having been to New Orleans, having seen Big Sam again, I saw Big Sam at Rock and Bowl in New Orleans. And, wow. and okay. I was like, okay, I get it. It's just, it's a party. It's a big, loud, yeah. fun party. Um, yep. And, and there's something to be said for it, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That, hey, that's crazy. Yeah. Uh, there was a few bands. Where I was like, yeah, where are you from again? Like, <laughs> really but but that's 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 the crazy thing. It's kind of like like I was saying, like with Jameson and all those guys moving to New Orleans. It's kind of like once you experience it, then a lot of a lot of shit starts to make sense. Mm -hmm. It was like, oh, now I get it. Yeah, because like you know, I'll go to New York and listen to jazz, and I'll go to like South Carolina and listen to jazz. Mm -hmm. It was like, okay, I think I like the the you know. So like to me, South Carolina, it's kind of it can get sloppy, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I like it. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. I guess that's from being in New Orleans because a lot of stuff is really dirty and was like kind of have some grunge that is not is not perfect. Yeah, you know. Yeah, and the more the more I learned about New Orleans music, the more something like Big Sam made sense to me because, like you know when. The first time I saw Big Sam, I thought New Orleans, and I I thought like you know Prez Hall and and all that kind of shit. Um, mm -hmm. But the the more I learned about it, the more I realized something like Big Sam's Funky Nation has more in common with like you know Big Frida or a Bounce Show than right. it does than it does with with Prez Hall or any sort of trad yeah. band or or even a brass band. Yeah, it's just that party atmosphere, you know, yeah. hard hard yeah, hard bumping. Dirty doesn't too. Say what? Big Sam was in a dirty dozen too. Yeah, I believe it. I right. totally believe it. What are some um, uh, some artists or venues? I mean, we've we've mentioned some already, but for people visiting New Orleans and particularly musicians or drummers, um, we hear about Bourbon Street and we hear about. Don't go to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not we to knock it, but oh, all right, Bourbon no. Street. Cover bands. Yeah, that's and great players. Right. I can't knock them. Like they, they have some cats that can just flat, flat out play, but it's cover bands. So it's uh Yeah. Yeah. Know, yeah. I get tired of that. I don't want to hear, you know, Queen and you know, we are the champions five times a night. But that's personal. Right. Whatever. No, I I thought I thought the same thing. Like the first time I walked down Bourbon Street, I was like, everybody told me that there is live music in every place on bourbon street and it's true but it's all it's all it's all cover bands um, right except for except for uh i saw gerald french at Ross um Sinesta. at what at the at the royal Sinesta. no no it was that there's a little like beer hall like a little kind of german style um yeah i, I forgot the name of it but yeah the i'll think of it Terry, i no that ain't it. that's another place um, um i think he still plays there yeah yeah I'll think of it, but that's like the one the one place on Bourbon Street that actually has like live jazz and some trad jazz. You go in there. But actually, now what what year did you come to New Orleans? That was two thousand thirteen, maybe. Okay, so now inside of the Royal Sinesta, they have a club, and like you'll get some like really good stuff. Like it's not cover bands. It's cool. Like like you might have like Jermaine Basil in there playing. Yeah. You might have like Tarkinowski. Uh Gerald French actually has his trap man there on Mondays, I think. Um but you'll have, you know, John Vodakovich play, you know, one night. You know, it's right. like they've opened that up. Right. So my 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 question where I was going with that was, you know, we, we hear about Bourbon Street, we hear about the French Quarter, but for for people visiting there, can you uh, talk about some other artists, some other venues, some other neighborhoods uh, that uh, that should be should be checked out? Okay, well, 
All right, I'll start with the top that most people know of. Well, sh should look up. The Maple Leaf is the main one. That is towards the end of Carrollton in, in New Orleans. Um, that's actually, that's where I first heard Russell play. Mm -hmm. Papa Girls Funk did a long stint. Now, uh, Josh Porter plays there every Monday night now. Um, if he's in town, obviously. But uh, that spot, uh, there's like on Frenchman Street, which is close to the French Quarter. Yeah. But there's like Blue Nile, uh, DBA, Snug Harbor, where um, you'll like Ellis Marcellus plays there on Fridays. Right. And there's a really like dirty spot across the street from DBA called mm -hmm. the Spotted Cat. I love that place, man. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I love that place. So you have there, um, I'm trying to think, uh, Corey Henry plays at, I can't think of the name of the club right now, but it's like more in the Bywater neighborhood um, where like he plays on Thursday nights. I can't think, why well, I can't think of the name of this place. Because I'm putting but, you on blast and that's what happens, you know. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you're you winning. <laughs> but like the High Hole Lounge, now there's a spot, the High Hole Lounge, there's a DJ, uh, DJ Soul Sister. Mm-hmm. She does a Saturday night thing over there, like like old school, like rare funk tunes and stuff like that. So killing. And Hi Ho does like all kind of different stuff, but like that's a good place to like check out. Uh, where else? Uh, Preservation Hall, if you want like the, the straight ahead trash stuff from New Orleans. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to think. And Spotted Cat has quite a quite a bit of like straight ahead trad, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, they, it stretches. Uh, like uh, there's more there's more that's like a jazz club bottom line right they right. do like straight ahead like uh, a friend of mine he plays sunday nights uh pat casey no um, that's probably if you were here on the sunday and you went there on the sunday night that's probably who you heard playing uh pat casey and the new sound like mm -hmm. they're like yeah they're badass <laughs> <laughs> uh what else uh and there's a lot of other clubs that kind of recently opened up on on in that french street area uh, some of them for the better. Some of them I'm kind of like, yeah, why did you even come here with, with this bullshit? <laughs> <laughs> but it is what it is. Yeah. Uh, but Frenchman Street, you can kind of get more of a variety than like your cover band stuff. Uh, where else? Is there anyone else? Yeah. The is Candlelight there? Lounge, which is in the Tremaine neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And like on a Monday, they have somebody. I don't know about their weekly schedule, but yeah. Yeah. I, I remember uh, spending a day in, in the Garden District, and I don't know if there's any music venues there, but um, that was like, that was, a, I, I mean, whether whether or not Tipitina's. you're going to- Yeah. Is Tipitina's <laughs> over there? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And aside from the music, the Garden District, I, I think is just super cool and yeah. a, a, a good place to spend a day. Um, oh, that's the other spot. I just thought about it. Le Bon Ton. Soul Rebels play there every Thursday night. Cool. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> good. All right, so listeners, if you're headed to New Orleans, you got you got no excuse to to hang out on Bourbon Street for a week. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> By all means, if there's projects you're working on now or stuff you got coming up, let's hear about it. All right. Um, my wife's my wife's project um was called the Greenhouse Effect. Mm -hmm. Um, she has a whole bunch of cats that did work. on. This guy, he's a singer, Molly Music. He's from Georgia. Actually, yeah, the guy who did most of the producing, he's from Georgia. Mm -hmm. His name is uh, Ramon Gaskin. Uh, he goes by Drum Deucer. <laughs> pretty, like, hey, badass cat, dude. Nice. Like, so hey. so your wife is, is doing a bunch of gigs on the back of this record, and you're, yeah. you're, you're, you're doing it with her? I'm doing pretty much 85% of all the stuff. Cool, cool. Unless it's like, yeah... I'm going to go with like a percussionist this time. And I'll be like, yeah, I don't want to do that. So I'll get like somebody else. Right. And what's your wife's name? Karen green, Karen with the C. Uh, and the, so the greenhouse effect. I get yeah. it. <laughs> ah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> dig, dig. Yeah. And there's, I mean, there's a rich, uh, this is another thing I just thought of. There's a rich recording history in new Orleans. Um, as far as, you know, records that have come out of there and studios that have been there yeah. and that are still there. Yeah. Um, what are what are some of the some of the studios that are that are cranking out the good stuff right now? Man, the parlor studio. Jameson Ross is in there as we speak. He's, as we speak, he's yeah, yeah, yeah he's a dude. That studio is like the business. 
as I was watching the show Treme, like there, there's a bunch of scenes in that show that take place, you know, at a gig or at a concert or in a studio. And that they, they made reference to like the New Orleans style of recording, which is basically live everybody in one room. Yeah. Like, is that, is that a thing? Is that for real? It, it is. It is a thing, man. Um, if somebody says, Hey, let's do a session. Unless it's like some straight ahead, like R and B person that knows like, well, I have this track, but I just want to play live. You know, other than that, it's like you walk in, it's kind of like, Hey, let's write starting mm-hmm. now. Mm-hmm. So, you know, yeah. Like some people might have like an idea in their head and like, hey, let's try to see if it works and just build it from there. Right. And you were saying how like the, the New Orleans style of, of tracking is just live, everybody in one room. Yeah. And what what kind of I mean, that that captures a live vibe, right? Yeah. A part of the New and, Orleans feel. Yeah, it, it is like, um, you know, most records that you hear from New Orleans, it has that man like. They did this at the club or something. Uh-huh. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And like, it'll sound good, but it'll just be like, man, this really feels like the show. But then even when you go to the show, now it's like you even get a whole nother level of what, what they really want it to be. Yeah. You know, like Dumpster Funk is like, a, I guess, a really good example because they'll do a studio record. But you see them live, you see like Tony Hall and them on stage and they're like, like spazzing out and like just just right. going for broke like yeah. every song is like all right now nah, we're gonna do this like, <laughs> let's put nah man play this change like in the middle of a gig like wow so that's cool so, so it's like I, I guess most songs like even though it starts in the studio like when you see a band playing it live like now you're getting like the reprise of the song all of a sudden it's like mm-hmm. wait up y'all rearranged the whole song like this ain't the same song i, I like i like this but man that's killing me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah Man, I really appreciate you talking with me. No problem, dude. It's great no. to hear. Great to hear about New Orleans. You are the first New Orleans guy that uh, that we've had on the podcast, and and yeah. we <laughs> <laughs> represent. Yes, sir. We hope to have more. Thanks so much, man. Really appreciate it. All right, thank you. Thanks again to Jermall Watson, especially for letting us take up his lunch hour. I really dug hearing about New Orleans from a New Orleans native, and I hope you did too. I hope we can uh, talk to some more of those cats in the future. And if you get there, remember, uh, Frenchman Street is your spot for live music, not Bourbon Street. And by all means, check out some great jazz, but don't miss all the other kinds of amazing music that New Orleans has to offer. Be sure to follow us on social media and share your pics and videos of your gigs using the hashtag Working Drummer. You can subscribe to the podcast on iTunes and leave us a rating and review there if you please. Thanks to Mike Jackson for his technical assistance. And as always, thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.